don't start clicking off. I promise we are going to get to the preaching in just a moment. But first, my name is Bobby, and I just wanted to thank you for downloading or streaming this sermon. We love that you're here listening or watching online, but we want you to know that we have a spot saved for you when you are ready to experience FBC in person on a Sunday at one of our three services. Let us know how we can pray for you today by texting Prayer FBC to 970-00 while watching this message. Stick around after the service because we have some more information about how to get connected. For now, sit back and enjoy today's message. Well, it is great to see you here today, and if you have your Bible with you, I want to ask you to turn to the book of Acts, chapter 15. We'll just be looking at six short verses this morning, Acts 15, verses 36 to 41. You know, I love that song that we just got through singing to our Lord, that His love never gives up on us. And one of the ways that He demonstrates that to us is through what I like to call people in the Bible, I like to call them intersectors. People that God would send across paths with a particular person at just the right time with just the right message. Now, we know that the Apostle Paul had at least a couple. There was Ananias who, when Paul was blinded on the road to Damascus, was sent by God to lay hands on the Apostle Paul and through which he would receive his sight. But another really important intersector in Paul's life was Barnabas. Paul would always have to be grateful for the influence that Barnabas had on his life. No doubt, a person sent by God at just the right time with just the right message. Let me remind you a little bit about the history of that relationship between Paul and Barnabas. It really goes back to Acts chapter 9 when, remember, Paul, who was a Pharisee of the Jews, was actively persecuting those who were proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah. And in Acts chapter 9, we are... uh, Luke shows us that Paul was actually on his way to Damascus. He had received letters from the church in Jerusalem to persecute all of those, the Scripture says, who were of the way. That's a reference to Jesus who said and recorded in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. And Paul, being very zealous for the Jewish law and wanting to persecute anybody who he felt was going against the law, and certainly he believed that Jesus claimed a Messiah was going against the law, Paul was zealously persecuting those who were following Jesus, and that light shone down on his face, and there was an appearance of Jesus on his way to Damascus, really just knocked him to the ground, and he was blinded. And as I mentioned a few moments ago, God sent Ananias to intersect Paul's life in Damascus and lay his hands on him. He received his sight, and he heard that commission from the Lord that God had specifically chosen him to be his witness before Gentiles, kings, and the people of Israel. And so Paul immediately began proclaiming the gospel of Jesus, that Jesus really is the way. You can imagine the influence of that message coming from him, uh, one who had been persecuting those who were of the way. But Paul is proclaiming that Jesus really is the way, the truth, and the life. And, well, he was persecuted there in Damascus, and he had to be uh, sent away. He eventually finds himself in Jerusalem, and this is still in Acts chapter 9, and he tries to join the band of disciples that had gathered together for the ministry of the gospel and prayer, but you remember the disciples, they they weren't so crazy about that. They knew who Paul was. They knew his former life, and even though Paul had told them that he had changed, that he had seen Jesus, and now he was a follower of the way, well, because of his history, they had a really hard time believing him. But Barnabas intersected Paul's life at just the right time, with just the right message. Barnabas comes into those disciples and he vouches for Paul. He reminds them of what Paul, well, he tells them that what Paul had been saying about giving his life to Christ was absolutely true, that that blindness that he had and that appearance of Jesus that he saw, and he vouched for Paul's new character. And uh, Barnabas took a good risk. I mean, can you imagine had that not worked out, had that turned against him? Man, the devastation that would have happened, not only with the disciples, but with the church in Jerusalem. But Barnabas was there willing to take a big risk for the apostle Paul. And as a result, the disciples welcomed Paul. And he was able to share the gospel in Jerusalem until once again persecution arose towards him and he had to be sent away. And then we find in Acts chapter 11 where the gospel is spreading now to Gentile lands. And the gospel comes to the people in Antioch and many Gentiles or non-Jews in Antioch of Syria place their faith in Jesus. Jesus. 
the Jerusalem church. This was kind of new to them, and so they wanted to find out what really was going on in Antioch, and they thought there wouldn't be anybody better than Barnabas to go check things out and encourage them if everything they heard was true. And so Barnabas goes to Antioch in Syria, and he meets with those new believers there, and he sees that, sure enough, they really were genuine converts to Christianity. They really were part of the kingdom of God, that God had done an incredible work among those Gentiles. And Barnabas recognizes that these new Gentile believers, they needed to be discipled. They didn't have all of the Jewish history like the Jewish believers had. And so he thought there wouldn't be anybody better than Paul. And so Barnabas goes to Tarsus, where Saul had departed to from Jerusalem, and he brings Paul back to Antioch, and together they disciple those new believers in Antioch. From the church in Antioch, They hear the call from God that they were to be sent out, Paul and Barnabas, on a missionary journey. And so you can kind of look at this from Paul's perspective as, well, his big break, right? Because God had told him that he was going to be his chosen vessel before Gentiles and kings and his people. And really that would begin not just after the discipling of the believers in Antioch, but when they began that first missionary journey. And remember, it was Barnabas who went and got Paul. So Barnabas had taken a big risk for Paul. And Barnabas really had been used by God to give Paul his big break. Nothing could ever separate them, right? All that Barnabas had done for Paul. If Paul was going to continue to be loyal to anybody. If anybody would be a forever friend and one he would be forever grateful to. It would be Barnabas. Surely nothing could ever separate them. Or maybe not. Let's look at Acts 15, verse 36. Then after some days, now this is a reference to last week we saw uh, the Jerusalem council where there was the big uh, question over whether or not Gentiles had to become Jews first before they became a part of the kingdom of God. And Paul and Barnabas, you remember, went to Jerusalem. They met with the apostles and elders, and we talked about how to handle conflict in a church. And we saw where the church said, listen, no, you don't have to be a Jew first in order to be a part of the kingdom of God. Salvation is by grace through faith. The Jerusalem church sent a letter by Paul and Barnabas and by Judas, also called Barsabbas, and uh, Silas to the church in Antioch, clearing things up. So that's what it's referenced to in verse 36, after some days. It's some days after that. Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. This is a surprise passage in the text. Because as we saw last week in Acts 15, 1 through 35, we saw how the Scripture guides us in how to handle conflict. And now two people who were major players in that discussion, Paul and Barnabas, now they have a conflict that they can't work out except to agree to disagree. And it all centers around John Mark. Now remember, John Mark was a cousin of Barnabas. And when Paul and Barnabas were sent by the church in Antioch to take a relief offering to Jerusalem, while they were in Jerusalem, Luke records for us in Acts, they picked up John Mark, and they brought him with them back to Antioch. And then when they went on that first missionary journey, they took Mark with them. And though they had gone to one place and shared the gospel there and received a little bit of persecution, they went to another place. And when they got uh, gone to the island of Cyprus first, and then they went further on from there, when they reached the shore on the other side, Mark decided he wanted to turn around and go back home. Now, unfortunately, Luke doesn't tell us why. Maybe Mark was homesick. Maybe Mark was having some trouble with all of these Gentiles coming to faith in Christ. Maybe that was just so new for him, it was hard for him to wrap his mind around. 
Maybe Mark had some disagreement with Paul. I mean, who knows? The Scripture doesn't say. All it tells us is that somehow, some way, Mark changed his mind, and he decided to go back. So now as Paul says to Barnabas, let's go back to the churches that we started on that first missionary journey and let's see how they're doing. Because Paul knew that they were going to face some difficult times and he wanted to encourage those churches to continue along. And Barnabas thought it was a good idea as well, but he wanted to take Mark with him. And Paul said, no way, no how. There is no way I'm going to take that deserter with me. We don't have time for that drama. There's no way we're going to give him a second chance of going with us on this missionary journey. He had his chance, and he blew it. Forget it. Now, remember, Barnabas was an encouraging guy, right? Think about what Barnabas had done for Paul. Think about how Barnabas had taken a big risk in commending Paul to the disciples when the disciples didn't believe in him. Think about how it was Barnabas who gave Paul his big break in bringing him to Antioch, the place from which he would be sent on that first missionary journey, which and would be the story, really, of his life and ministry. You expect Barnabas to be an encourager. You expect Barnabas to say, we need to give him a second chance. But Paul says, absolutely not. Five things that I want you to see from this passage of Scripture. Here's the first one. I want you to see that God's people aren't perfect. Somewhere along the line, we have grown to believe that the Bible is filled with stories of how God uses perfect people to do great things for His name, and it's not true. The Bible is filled with stories about how a great God uses imperfect people to do great things in His name. With the exception of Jesus Christ, who, remember, is God in the flesh. There is no such thing as a perfect person. God has never used perfect people. Think with me about some of the greats in Scripture, some people that you've known about all of your life. Remember Abraham? You know what Abraham's struggle was? Faith. And that sounds kind of odd to us because we consider Abraham a father of the faith. But that was his struggle. He was developed into a father of the faith. He wasn't that way to begin with. Oh, sure, in Genesis 11 and 12, when God tells Abraham to leave his uh, family and to leave his country and go to a land that he would show him, yeah, he went, but he actually stopped along the way. He needed a little push with that. But yeah, he went. But remember, God gave him that promise that he was going to provide him a child. And, well, Abraham's tendency early on in that walk with God is that he he had a tendency to take matters into his own hands. You remember in Genesis 15 where he comes to God and says, I've got a servant named Eleazar. Why don't let's just make him the son that you're supposed to give me? Because Abraham didn't believe that God was really going to give him a son. And then remember, Abraham had relations with his maidservant, Hagar, and through her had a child, Ishmael, because again, Abraham got tired of waiting on God. He he questioned whether or not God was really going to be able to give him a son through Sarah, so he took matters into his hands another time, and through that, had a child. And, well, that was just disastrous. And so Abraham's struggle was he lacked faith. The more he walked with God, the more... He grew in his faith, and therefore he's a father of the faith, but it it didn't begin that way. Or or remember Moses? Remember Moses' imperfection? Moses didn't have any confidence in himself. Remember when when God called Moses uh, the, the, the burning bush in Midian? Moses had left Egypt in shame, and now he was a shepherd in Midian, and God appears before him and tells him that he wants him to go back to Egypt, and he wants him to confront Pharaoh. Remember what Moses said? God, I'm, I'm not an eloquent speaker. I, I'm, I'm not very good at that. Surely, you would rather have somebody else other than me. You see, Moses didn't have any confidence in himself. Now, on the other hand, remember in the New Testament, Peter. Peter had way too much confidence in himself. Peter. 
Peter was all the time making promises and making all of these bold claims about things that he would do and things that he would never do. And, of course, you remember what Peter's probably maybe most known for is how he denied the Savior three times at a real critical moment in the, there in the garden when Jesus was arrested. So we love stories about Abraham, and we love stories about Moses, and we love stories about Peter, but every single one of those people were imperfect. And that should be a great encouragement to you and to me. You know, I was reading in, uh, I think it's John Ortberg's book, I believe it's Oh, the Places That You Go. And he's talking about a guy who just, you know, he, he really had a checkered past. And, and, and you know, it kind of felt like God was calling him into the ministry, but he just didn't know that he was going to be able to do that because he knew his background. He knew the mistakes that he made. And this guy said, God's yes was greater than my no. Man, I sure can't identify with that. How about you? Aren't there times where you look at your life and you would say, you know, God could never love me or God could never use me. There's no way that, I, that I'm qualified to tell somebody else about the riches of Christ because they, they know me. They know my background. They know the decisions that I've made. There's no way that I could be a community group leader. No way that I could serve as a deacon or no way that I could ever serve in ministry because I've just made too many mistakes. I am way too imperfect. Well, friend, the text reminds us here that God's people, they're not perfect. So even though Paul and Barnabas had an incredible moment there at the beginning of Genesis 15 in the Jerusalem council, and now they're fighting with each other and they, they can't figure it out. Here's the second thing that I want you to see from this text. Boy, you talk about practical and relevant. This is a really good one. Not all decisions are easy to make. We have a hard time with that too, don't we? Because we just feel like in the Christian life, everything should be black and white. Everything should be just cut and dry. It should be easy. And when you think about the, the problem that they faced in, at the beginning of chapter 15 with the Jerusalem council on whether or not Gentiles had to become a Jew before they were a part of the kingdom of God, that really was a pretty cut and dry deal, wasn't it? Because James is hearing testimony from Peter about how God worked through him. And he's hearing testimony from Paul and Barnabas about how God was working in them. But then he was able to put two and two together with that passage in Amos in the Old Testament. And so James was able to make a really clear decision based upon how God was at work through the testimony of his people and through the Scripture and able to say no salvation is by grace through faith and God from eternity has wanted Gentiles to be a part of the kingdom of God. That, though it seemed like a difficult one, was really an easy one. But not every decision is easy to make. Here's a question for you. As it pertains to this disagreement between Paul and Barnabas, who do you think was right? Because you could use Scripture to argue both sides, couldn't you? From Paul's perspective, if you're going to carry somebody on the mission field, right, that person should be of proven character. Remember what the Scripture says about deacons and shepherds, how they should be proven trustworthy by the pattern of their lives, not that they're perfect, but there should be a record of being proven. Was Mark proven? Eh, Maybe not. From Barnabas' side, giving a man a second chance, is that biblical? <laughs> yeah, of course it is. And so who's right, Paul or Barnabas? I don't know, and you don't know. Because for one, we don't know why Mark left. But for two, we know that Paul and Barnabas are both godly men who were only seeking to do what God wants them to do. Men who are wise enough to base their decisions on the Word of God as well as how God has been at work. They've experienced that with the Jerusalem Council. And so here's a tough one. Sometimes not all decisions are easy to make. It's the third thing that I want you to see today. And that is that God's purpose is bigger than you. Now, that's been our theme throughout this sermon series, Bigger Than You. 
that God has a purpose for your life that's bigger than you, that requires a power that is bigger than you. But where do we see that in today's passage? In today's passage, we see it in that with Paul and Barnabas, it's really hard to know who's right and who's wrong. What we do know is that they're imperfect. They should be able to work this out, right? They should be. But for whatever reason, they're not able to work it out, and so they just agree to disagree. But here's why that ends up, at the end of the day, being about how God's purpose is bigger than us. Because those churches that they had started on that first missionary journey, they needed to be encouraged. They needed to be strengthened. There's no question that God wanted them back there and reminding them of the incredible promises of God and exhorting them to continue on in the faith. And the longer they spent arguing with one another over whether or not they were supposed to take Mark, the more difficult things would become on those churches. And so Paul and Barnabas, unable to work it out, just at the end of the day, decided to agree to disagree. And instead of keeping the work from continuing, they parted ways and they went to the work. Listen, here's the deal. When we talk about how God has a purpose for your life that's bigger than you, that requires a power that's bigger than you, another thing that I want you to see is that God's purpose for the church is bigger than you. It's bigger than you. And so sometimes we can get hung up on little petty things. Sometimes people can say things that offend us or we can disagree with this or that or whatever. And we can just put our foot in the sand and we can keep the work of God from continuing until we get our way. Remember what we talked about last week? The goal of conflict resolution is never for you to win. The goal of conflict resolution is always for God to win. With this disagreement between Paul and Barnabas that they were unable to work out, it was just better in this case for them to agree to disagree and continue on with the work of spreading the gospel. And so the spread of the gospel wasn't hindered because they realized God's work was just bigger than them winning an argument. Here's the fourth thing that I want you to see, and we're going to camp on this one for a little bit. And that is that God is greater than our mistakes. God is greater than our mistakes. Now, I just made the point that it was better for them to just agree to disagree because they weren't going to be able to work it out. But, but I still want to come back to the point that they should have worked it out, right? They should have worked it out. They didn't, so it was better to just continue on with the work even if they went separately. But they should have worked it out, right? I mean, they, they, this, this is something that should have been resolved. But God is greater even than the mistake of Paul and Barnabas in not being able to resolve their conflict in that as they go their separate ways, Barnabas and John Mark go to the island of Cyprus to the west. Paul and Silas go north and west along the coastline. And at the end of the day, aren't they able to cover more territory in less time because they split up and actually multiplied? There's four of them instead of two. Of course, right? And so the work is continuing and in fact can be argued that it's actually expanding. So God is greater than our mistakes. Now there are a couple of subpoints to this one that I want you to, to process through with me. Here's the first one I want you to see. You never know how God may use today's decisions tomorrow. Here's what I mean by that. Who did Paul take with him? Silas. Why was Silas a candidate for this second missionary journey? It goes back to James at the beginning of Acts 15, doesn't it? Because you remember, after James listened to the testimony of Peter and listened to the testimony of Paul and Barnabas about how God was saving Gentiles and they were coming into the kingdom of God without being Jews first, 
And James decided to send a letter to the church at Antioch to clear everything up and say, listen, you don't have to become a Jew first in order to be a part of the kingdom of God. Here's some things we're going to ask you, but you don't have to be a Jew first. He sent that letter by Paul and Barnabas, but he also sent two other people, right? Judas, also called Barsabbas, Luke tells us, and Silas. You know what that says to me? That says to me that God knew about this conflict between Paul and Barnabas before it ever happened. Silas ended up being a perfect partner for Paul to go on his next missionary journey. But Silas was only there and available because James did the right thing and he sent Silas to Antioch. You know that verse, Romans 8, 28, your mama probably quoted it to you a lot when you were growing up about how God works all things together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. That's a verse that describes a theological term called the sovereignty of God. And the sovereignty of God means that God is so great that our mistakes don't mess Him up. That God can even use the evil intentions of men to accomplish His purposes. And certainly God can use our mistakes to accomplish his purposes. And so we see how this decision from James at the beginning of Acts 15, God knew about this division between Paul and Barnabas and that it was going to happen. And just as Barnabas had Mark, Paul had Silas. And God's still at work, right? Here's the second sub-point that I want you to see, and that is that the sovereignty of God, though, is never an excuse for you to sin. Rather, it testifies to the greatness of God. You see, a problem that you and I have is because generally we always want to make ourselves feel a little bit better, right? (laughs) And so we never want our sins to seem as bad as maybe it appears. That's why, by the way, oftentimes we call our sins mistakes. Mistakes don't sound as bad as just outright rebellion, right? And so because we have that tendency to make ourselves look a little bit better, sometimes we'll haul off into a bad decision. Sometimes we'll excuse our sin by saying, well, you know what? God used it anyway. You know, yeah, I made a wrong decision here, but you know what? God is sovereign and and God's not dependent upon me and God's able to use that for his bigger purpose. And so everything worked out in the end. Well, that's never an excuse for you to sin. Think about Genesis chapter 50. You remember how Joseph's brothers were jealous of him and they threw him into that pit. And then from that pit, he ended up being sold into slavery by Midianite traders and found himself in Egypt. Remember, he was falsely accused of in Egypt and then he was thrown into a prison. So Joseph's life was absolutely horrible, all because his brothers were jealous of him and they tried to get rid of him. But then God, who is sovereign, worked through all of that, didn't he? And Joseph was raised up as prime minister in Egypt because God knew that a famine was coming to the land of Canaan. And God had placed, sovereignly placed Joseph right there in that position to be able to save his people from extinction through that famine. So you look at that passage about Joseph's life and you go, my goodness, I, I mean, yeah, the brothers were, they did a bad thing, but... Man, if they wouldn't have done that, then this wouldn't have happened. And God worked all of that out for his good, so it just all works out in the end. You see in Genesis chapter 50, when the brothers are scared to death to come to to Joseph and how Joseph's going to treat them after everything has turned out. You see where Joseph says, you know what, what you intended for evil, God meant for good. He wasn't saying that, listen, what you guys did, it's okay. You know what, what you guys did actually was... You just did what God wanted you to do. Now, what you did was evil. But God is greater than that. Or you think about the gospel message that the apostles were proclaiming in Jerusalem right after the day of Pentecost or on the day of Pentecost. They were continually saying to the Jewish leaders, you turned Jesus over to the authorities. And you crucified him by your hands. 
But he was also constantly saying, wasn't he? That all of this was according to the predetermined plan of God. So God was sovereign over all of it. But he was still holding them guilty for their sin of rejecting Jesus. And so, yes, God is greater than our mistakes. God is sovereign, and he works through imperfect people. And even God is so great that through our mistakes, he can just do incredible things. But it's never an excuse for our sin. We can never look back and say, well, it all just worked out. I mean, I I messed up, but it's okay because God did it and did a great thing. No. It just testifies to how great God is, not how your sin helped him out. Okay? And then the final thing that I want you to see in today's passage is this. Never, ever give up on people. Now, I want you to turn from Acts, I want you to move forward to 2 Timothy, if you'll turn there, please. Many years have passed since this moment in Paul and Barnabas' life, when there's contention that they had, when they had a divide. And Mark is actually mentioned in a couple of Paul's letters, so is Barnabas, by the way, so it seems like things have worked out. Paul has actually used Mark some. But as we come to 2 Timothy chapter 4, Timothy is Paul's protege. And Paul is encouraging Timothy to continue strong in the work that God had given him to do. And Paul recognizes that his life is nearing the end. And so these are kind of Paul's final words that are here recorded for us. And I want you to see them. 2 Timothy chapter 4, let's look together at verse 6. Let's, Let's kind of put ourselves in Paul's shoes for a moment and kind of think through his pen. He says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Be diligent. To come to me quickly. For Demas has forsaken me. He loved the present world and has departed for Thessalonica. Crescens for Galatia. Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. And then he says, get Mark. And bring him with you. For he is useful to me. For ministry. See, Paul had a change of heart, didn't he? Scripture doesn't tell us why. Doesn't tell us all the things that Mark did or didn't do. It doesn't tell us whether Paul at some point said, you know what, I, 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 I should have taken Mark. I should have listened to Barnabas. Doesn't say all that. Still doesn't tell us who was right between Paul and Barnabas. We don't, we don't have that there. It's one of those when you get to heaven, you're going to ask, right? But what we do have here is that at the end of his life, Paul recognized God's hand on Mark and how he needed him. It probably would have been easier for Paul to just forget he ever knew the name John Mark. He didn't take him with him on that second missionary journey. They had parted ways. Remember, this was before social media. It was before email. It wasn't just going to be real easy to communicate. And so it would have been really easy for Paul to just go his own way and never think another thing about John Mark. I mean, he had deserted him. But he didn't. Paul never gave up on Mark. And towards the end of his life, He asks for him. You know, as I've thought about that passage of Scripture, not only do I try to see that from Paul's mind as he writes those words with his pen, 
But I also try to see it from Mark's perspective. When he hears this letter read, you know Mark felt guilty about leaving Paul and Barnabas on that first missionary journey. You know there were times that he just could have kicked himself and you know he was down on himself from time to time. But then as he hears these words read towards the end of Paul's life, get Mark and bring him with you. I want him here. He's useful to me in ministry. Don't you know that just puts a mare in his lungs? Put a stride in his step. Don't you know that Mark couldn't wait to get to Paul? Because it just gave him new life. You know why it's important to never give up on people? Because it's the message of the gospel. Remember we talked about this last week, what Jesus said in, in, in Matthew. When he said, you, you are the light of the world. And he said, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. And, and we talked about how that means that when, when God calls us together as a church, his desire is for us to be a city within the city. And to operate in such a way. And to deal with each other in such a way that we show the earthly city what the kingdom of heaven looks like. Isn't the message of the gospel that God can't and we can? I mean, that we can't and God can. Let me get that right. Is it the message of the gospel? That God who loves us created us and had a perfect plan for our lives. But we have sinned. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And isn't the message of the gospel that even though we deserted God, God came looking for us. Through his son Jesus Christ who lived on this earth and was without sin. And who went to the cross to take the penalty that our sin required. Died, was buried, and rose again on the third day. In order to give us new life. And to bring us reconciliation with God. Is there somebody in your life that you've given up on? And by the way. If you know much about the Bible, sometimes we can have a tendency to be a little smart alecky, can't we? And so you might know enough to be dangerous, and you might be sitting there, and you might be going, well, hold on, 1 Corinthians 5, 5, 1 Corinthians 5, 5. Paul talks about turning such a one who's been rebelling, turning such a one over to Satan. So what are you going to do about that one, preacher? I'm going to ask you to read the rest of 1 Corinthians 5, 5. Which says, it is better, better for the body to perish and the spirit to be saved. So what Paul is saying is, yes, sometimes people make their bed and they need to lie in it. Sometimes we need to allow people to suffer some consequences for their actions. But he's saying it is always for the purpose of them being restored back to God. Because that's the message of the gospel. So is there somebody that you've given up on? People will disappoint us. Remember? There's no such thing as perfect people. God throughout history with the exception of Jesus has never used a perfect person. Remember that. And give them grace. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you this morning for just bringing us into a real-life situation. As maybe crazy as it sounds, it, it brings great comfort to us to see that Paul and Barnabas were imperfect just like we are.
there is some comfort in realizing that somebody as great as John Mark, he, he was a deserter. Thank you for reminding us today that you, you don't use perfect people. But you use imperfect people to show your perfection. Thank you for helping us to acknowledge today that every decision that we face in life is not easy. Sometimes there's tough ones. Sometimes things aren't just quite cut and dry like we'd like them to be. But thank you for reminding us this morning that you're sovereign. You can use our mistakes. You can work over them to accomplish your purposes. And for reminding us today that you never give up on us. Lord, I pray that even now with our heads bowed and our eyes closed that you're you're just shining a light on our hearts. That you're helping us to see that you hadn't given up on us. That with all of our imperfections, you still want to use us. Father, help us to think about maybe people in our lives that we've given up on. And Lord, help us not to do that. Help us to live the gospel. Help us to be that city within a city. Help us to do things differently than the world would do things. And show your greatness. Father, as we come to this time of invitation, just help us to make that decision you've been leading us to make. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for watching or listening to this message. We want you to know that for us, church is so much more than just a sermon or a Sunday service. If you're new with us today, we want you to know that there's a place perfect for you at FBC. We have a simple way for you to get connected today. Text the phrase Connect FBC to 97000 and complete the digital connect card with as much information as you feel comfortable sharing. Again, thank you for being here today and we want you to know that God is for you, God is for the church, and that God is for Starkville.